This next tutorial is an easy way to stay cozy year round. Soft to the touch and fluffy enough to keep you warm. Today, you can find glory in sewing your own sweatpants. And the first thing you're gonna need is the pattern. There's a free PDF pattern, which when printed looks like this. But if you don't have access to a large format printer or a plotter, no worries, I do have the paper pattern available on my site. This instructional video will show you step-by-step -step how to sew your own sweatpants, which is a very classic and simple design, but I'll also have customizable options. I got three different ways that you can cuff or hem them. You could do a normal hem, or you could do an elastic cuff, or you could do a rib knit cuff. So there really is some flexibility on how you wanna make these pants. You can customize them, add your own details, maybe some extra pockets, or change the shape of the leg opening because at the end of the day, that's what sewing's all about. You wanna put your own spin on things, add a little twist so that it caters to your style because these pants are made for you, by you, so you should make them how you like them. This video lists out all the supplies and instructions you'll need with every step broken down and explained so that even beginners learning how to sew sweatpants can sew this as their first project. All right, let's start off with the tools required. So you're gonna need a sewing machine, of course, ideally with a zigzag stitch. Now zigzag stitch naturally has some stretch to it, so it'll be useful for a project like this where we're working with stretchy knit. However, I've done a, this project with just a straight stitch and it still works. I'll show you the limitations of the straight stitch as we progress, but just know that it is possible. Ideally, you'll wanna pair it with a stretch or ballpoint needle because they're designed specifically for working with knit. Their rounded tip slides between the tiny loops that make up the knit fabric rather than potentially piercing them with something like a pointed needle. The damage from the pointed needle can cause holes to develop along the seams if the fibers are damaged to the point of breaking, so using a ballpoint needle can actually extend the life of your project. And for needle size, an 80-12 will work for most fleece fabric. You'll need an iron and an ironing board, and know that fleece is a delicate material that's made of polyester. Because of this low melting point, we don't want to iron or press fleece with a hot iron, Instead, we'll try to use a lower temperature for this. Ideally, you're gonna want measuring tape, but if you don't have that, a ruler will do. You'll want chalk, though, because it's a stretch fleece, it does make it harder to mark with precision. And you'll want craft scissors for cutting your paper pattern, fabric scissors for cutting your fabric, and then pins uh, or clips, like these earth tone clips. And for optional tools, a serger or an overlocker for your stitches will automatically create these stretch stitches and tie up your raw edges at the same time. A rotary cutter and cutting mat because it's gonna be faster and help also reduce the distortion because when you cut, the fabric's gonna be flat on the table versus lifting it up to maneuver scissor blades underneath but scissors still work perfectly fine. And while a standard presser foot will do just fine, a walking foot will help if you do end up working with thicker fabric. A twin needle will also help because it creates two parallel stitches at once with these stitches having natural stretch to it. But again, these are just optional tools and accessories. While they might help make the process faster or change quality a little bit, you don't necessarily need them for this tutorial. In this video, I'm gonna use the bare bones, a standard sewing machine, ballpoint needle, standard presser foot, and we'll make sweatpants together using the same tools. Now we're gonna actually need some supplies to make the pants because you can't just whip them out of thin air, which I got all the supplies right here. These sewing DIY kits come with all the supplies you'll need to create your own sweatpants, starting with the fabric. We have sweatshirt fleece. It's probably the most common fabric for hoodies, sweatpants, and tracksuits. On the outside, it looks knitted, but on the inside, it's nice and fluffy, soft to the touch and sweatshirt fleece can also be called brushed fleece or cotton fleece. For the fabric, you'll wanna make sure you get high quality fleece like this in the DIY kits so that the outside doesn't pill after a few washes. Polar fleece is a second option. It's fluffy on both sides. I'll probably have a second kit for this because I do like the lightweight feel to them and they have some funky colors, which I also enjoy. And the last type of fleece is called micro fleece and that's something you actually wanna avoid using. It's typically used on baby clothes, but it's uh, a lot thinner and stretchier, just making it a little bit harder to work with, so I would avoid micro fleece. Just stick to sweatshirt fleece or polar fleece. For the fabric, you're gonna want about two and three quarter yards, which is about two and a half meters of fabric. And then pre-wash tips, number one, unfold the fabric before washing. Number two, 
don't overcrowd the machine, and three, use the same settings you would if you're washing normal sweatpants in the laundry machine. For the waist, we have 1.5 inch elastic, and generally you want two to four inches less than your waist measurement. And if you're gonna end up using your own elastic with draw cord attached to it, you'll probably wanna go for two inches less than your waist so that it's a little bit looser. You'll have the Glory Allen woven tag that comes with every DIY kit. For a normal hem, you won't need any extra fabric. All you'll do is fold up the bottom of the hem and stitch it. But if you are looking for an elastic cuff or the ribnet cuff, you can add these as add-ons. This is three quarters of an inch elastic for the elastic cuff, or you can order a ribnet in the matching color. And you'll also need some thread. Now thread, it's a good idea to match the fiber of your thread to the fiber of your fabric. That way it has similar properties when you're wearing it or when you're washing it. For this fleece, we'll use an all-purpose polyester thread for the top and bottom. And then on top of all that, you'll need the pattern. So there's three ways to get the pattern. You can get the PDF online and then have it printed at a local print and copy shop that has a large format printer. You can also get the paper pattern from my site, or if you get the DIY kit, the paper pattern comes in the DIY kit. You can also source all the fabric supplies and pattern yourself. This is just an easy option if you want to avoid going to the fabric store. If you can't find the right fabric or you can't print out the pattern, this is one easy solution. It comes all packaged up and shipped to your door. So with all my tutorials, I like to try to break down each step so you learn more than just what to do, you actually learn why you're doing it. And I'm hoping that this will help you learn how to sew online while actually sewing something. And while I try to make this as simple as possible so that someone with little to no experience can actually sew these pants, there are gonna be some tricky parts. But I hope that doesn't scare you because it really is an easy, fun project. I'll be using the same tools that most beginners should have. I'll be using the same fabric and supplies that come in the DIY kits, and I'll be following the same instructions. So if this is your first time sewing these sweatpants or sewing in general, then we could tackle it together. And without further ado, here is how to sew sweatpants for beginners. All right, so let's find some space for these extra, extra large patterns to cut them out. The first step is gonna be choosing your size. So if you have a highlighter, that'll really help for this step so you can identify which line you should be looking out for. We're gonna use a size guide or a sizing chart and find a size that we want and then highlight all those panels in that size so that we know what to cut. If you wanna preserve the original pattern or make multiple sizes, I do have another video that explains how to take this original pattern and trace it onto tracing paper, which then you trace onto oak paper, but it does involve a lot more steps. And for most beginners, I'm gonna assume we're gonna make for our size. So I'm gonna do like how I would suggest and just cut from the original pattern. Once everything is highlighted, we can cut it out and we only wanna use our craft scissors to cut paper. We never wanna use our fabric scissors to cut paper because it could dull your blades. Cutting out this pattern should take about five minutes. Now we have our panels, let's cut out the fabric. Knits technically don't have a grain line the same way wovens do because the fibers are not woven together, they're knit together. However, we still refer to knits as being on grain or off grain. This whole on grain, off grain talk could seem very confusing, but essentially we want to cut so that we maximize the stretch according to how we'll wear the garment. They call this cutting knits in the direction of the greatest stretch or dogs. And it's labeled on the pattern as well with arrows so you could check it out yourself. From up close, you'll see these little tiny lines in the fabric. And what that tells you is that the most stretch is perpendicular to these lines, which means you want these lines to run vertical with your body. That way the fabric will stretch horizontally around your body. So essentially the grain line label when matched with the vertical lines will then leave us with the maximum stretch going around our bodies. To help line up your cuts, fold the grain line along the arrow and use the crease as a guide to place it parallel with those vertical lines. So now that your panel is lined up, it's ready to cut. When you're pinning the paper to the fabric, you wanna pin sparingly. Like the sewing needles, these pins can pierce the fabric and cause damage. And that's kind of where a rotary cutter, cutting mat, and weights would work best as nothing gets pierced. But rotary cutters aren't essential, they're not necessary. Not everyone has a space for a large cutting mat like this. So scissors are totally fine. Uh, these ones are Kai scissors from my beginner tool pack. When you read the pattern, some of them have instructions like cut two. For cutting two, you could fold the fabric so it cuts two panels at once with one cut, 
but then you kind of want to avoid this because the knit's already so difficult to line up to the pattern. So while the top panel is cut maybe on grain, the bottom one might not be. The way I'd recommend it is to cut one on the fabric and then flip the pattern so it creates the alternate side. You could still use the same grain line fold and match it up to the vertical lines of the fabric, but by flipping the pattern, we're able to cut the shape inverted so that we get a left and a right side. Otherwise, we'd end up with two left legs or two right legs. We got everything cut out. Now's the fun part. Let's create that cozy fit, put everything together. Let's create some sweatpants. Let's go. The pattern panels are numbered in the order that we'll work with them in. So let's start with panel number one. Before we unclip it, start by notching where labeled in the three spots while it's still clipped together. Find the markers, snip just less than three eighths of an inch, somewhere around a quarter of an inch underneath the paper pattern. Then we're gonna unclip and take the pieces apart. We're gonna fold it in half horizontally to form the pocket. And you can kind of see how it'll look when it's attached to the left leg with the pocket slit at the corner. This is the pocket panel number one. One side will match the front leg panel, which is panel number two. And then the lower panel of the pocket will match the rear leg panel, panel number three beneath. Okay, let's start by attaching the pocket to the front leg panel, which are panels one and two. This is a glimpse of how it'll look when we do attach the pocket panel to the front leg. So we'll have the side pockets matched up and you'll notice the top edge of both panels also line up. To properly stitch them together, we need right sides together and we'll match up that side pocket edge on both panels, matching at where the corner of the out seam is. And you'll see that the top edge also still aligns well. It's very easy to tell the right and wrong side of this fleece, the smooth side being the right side and the fluffy side being the wrong side. For those new to sewing, most of the time we'll match up right sides together to stitch and that way when we flip the fabric right sides out, the stitches are then hidden on the inside of the garment. We're going to clip or pin them together only on that slanted side edge and then we're going to sew at 3 8 of an inch seam allowance, only on that side edge. All right, let's set this bad boy up and get started. If your machine has settings specifically for stretch fabrics, I would opt for those. Otherwise, the best kind of stitch for sewing fleece is gonna be a narrow zigzag stitch. This will give the seam some elasticity so the stitches don't break. If you have a serger, this will also give a strong elastic seam. To make it narrow, you're gonna have the width around one. And you can also use a straight stitch if that's your only option. I'll also note that most of the areas we're sewing aren't really vulnerable to getting stretched out, which is why I think a straight stitch is fine. For example, a straight stitch at somewhere like the neck hole would be bad because you'll break the stitches as you fit your head through a smaller hole versus the vertical seam of the pants. You're not really stretching it that hard, which is why I think a straight stitch is fine. I'll be doing a straight stitch to prove that it's possible and I also kind of prefer the look of the straight stitches here. So for this, I'll swing my width back to zero. Since fleece is a knit fabric beneath the fuzzy pile, a short stitch length can cause it to stretch and distort. So let's adjust our stitch length by making it slightly longer than usual, starting at three millimeters and potentially increasing it based on your test stitches, whether you're using a straight stitch or a zigzag stitch. And for sewing tension, I haven't found a solid answer on the internet besides decrease stitch tension. So 4.5 seems like the most common level for most projects. So let's start at 3.5. When testing out your stitches, do it on scrap fabric. Always test with two layers and use the numbers I said to guide you as a starting point, but adjust it based on your fabric, your machine and your own intuition. Instead of using gray thread to match the fabric, I'll use white thread so that maybe it's a little bit easier to see in the tutorial video. And while fleece looks fluffy, stretchy, and thick to the core, it only takes a light touch to get it through your sewing machine. So we'll lower the pressure of our presser foot to avoid any distortion and make it easier to zip through your project. Once you have your stitches, we'll do a quick pull test and the stitches should not break when you stretch them at the seam. Here's an example of a swatch sewn with a straight stitch, pulling, no big deal. So for my final settings, I'm gonna do a straight stitch, I'm gonna do a tension of three, 
and a length of three as well. And my last note, before we finally install some stitches, knit is very flimsy and stretchy. So try to work on a flat table and avoid having the fabric hang over the desk because it could stretch the fabric leading to some inconsistent stitches. So ideally fold it up on the table as you're going through your stitches. Let's grab panel number one and panel number two and actually start sewing this time. So the throat plate here has etched measurements to show you where to line up the fabric edge based on your seam allowance. For this project, we're gonna go with 3 8 of a seam allowance, which means the needle will create stitches 3 8 of an inch from the edge of your fabric. At the beginning and end of every single stitch, we're gonna add a back stitch, which is basically going over your previous stitches to help lock them in. So for the start, we'll go forward three stitches, hold the lever and reverse three stitches, and then continue sewing. We're gonna be removing clips as we sew along, letting the feed dogs underneath the throat plate pull the fabric and we use our hands just to guide the fabric through. Stitch right up to the edge and then back stitch to close off that stitch. By the end, our first few stitches should look something like this where we stitched the whole edge with a back stitch at both ends. So now let's do the other leg. We're gonna fold the fabric so it doesn't overhang and I like to work with the pocket panel on top so that I can see where to start and end my stitches. So for pressing, we wanna avoid high heat. Fleece is commonly made of polyester, which means high heat will cause the fabric to scorch or melt. We'll have to use the iron at a low temperature, so set that to low and then press open your seams. You won't be able to get a beautifully crisp fold like you would with other fabrics, but you'll be able to press open the seams well enough that it'll help. By pressing the seams open on the wrong side, this will allow us to get a cleaner fold to press the seam closed on the right side. And keep some clips handy close by because we'll want to clip those right away to keep the fold in place. This is what the pants would look like on the outside. And because we don't necessarily want to see the pocket fabric or seam from the outside, we can actually offset the seam a little bit with our clips, adjusting it so it's slightly beneath the front leg panel. In this way, from the outside, you won't risk seeing the pocket seam or fabric. Maybe a little bit more obvious with other fabrics and different colors, but still relevant for this. Before, there was a risk of the seam showing, which we don't want on the outside. So by readjusting the fold on the clips, we can hide that seam on the inside for good. So now we're gonna add a top stitch to hold this closed. So flip the panels over and with chalk, mark half an inch from the top of that side pocket seam. We can now stitch it close, starting from the chalk mark to the end of the seam. So with the pocket panel on top, sew at a quarter of an inch seam allowance from the chalk mark to the end of the seam. And do the same for both legs. Now to sew the side pocket shut, we're gonna isolate that pocket panel and fold it at the notch marks to identify the fold lines. Smooth out the fabric, make sure nothing is stretched out, and then clip the top and the bottom edges together. We're gonna sew the pocket shut at the bottom and the side. So if I have a choice to start at a folded edge or at the ends, I would typically start at the folded and work my way to that open end. Reason being, if you were to start from the ends and sew towards the fold, you run the risk of the fabric bunching, which would distort the fold and more likely in situations where the fabric is more sensitive. We're gonna start with a back stitch and then we're actually gonna sew on a curve. So you wanna let your machine pull the fabric through and your hands are just gonna slowly pivot the fabric so that it moves in the direction you want it to, keeping that consistent seam allowance. The key thing here is to be smooth and sync your hands pivoting with the feed of the sewing machine. Once you sew the bottom, you're gonna end up having to sew the side, which means you have to do a turn. So to sew on a turn, we're gonna stitch until we're about 3 8 of an inch from where we want to turn. Have the needle in the down position and then lift the presser foot up to then hold the fabric and pivot it so you can make that turn. And then once you're ready, pull the presser foot down and then continue sewing. When the needle's in the up position, our next stitch could move around creating some sloppy work versus having the needle in the down position. This allows us to continue sewing from our last stitch. Okay, so to finish off attaching the pocket to the front leg panel, and also to close off that top pocket. We're gonna open the panels so that the front leg panel is on top with the wrong sides up. 
match up the edge and then we're going to pin that front panel down. Basically, we're going to sew the pocket to the front panel down and then once we reach that top stitch, which you can kind of feel with your finger where it starts, we're going to turn to then close off the top of the pocket. So grab some chalk to mark where that turn is so you can get it a little bit more clear. And then we're going to sew at 3 8 of an inch seam allowance with a back stitch at the beginning. We're going to sew until the needle reaches that chalk mark. We're going to have the needle in the down position, lift the press foot up, pivot the fabric, drop the press foot back down, and then we're going to continue sewing, remembering to do that little back stitch at the end. Looking at the pants now, the front panel is coming along. It's almost complete. Let's add a top stitch to the remaining front panel down just for consistency. So press the fold flat and then we're gonna do a quarter inch top stitch. Starting from my previous top stitches, I'm gonna do a little bit of overlapping at the beginning and then we're gonna back stitch the beginning and the end. Okay, we got a great clean start to these pants and a big benefit to fleece is the raw edges don't fray. Therefore, seam finishes aren't really necessary. They become more of a matter of appearance and preference than we actually need them. But even though it's not required, we can still zigzag stitch the edges to keep the seams together. So if you wanna do that, change the stitch type to a zigzag stitch, change the length to three, tension of three, and the width to three. And when we're doing a zigzag stitch, we're not gonna go over the edge of the fabric or onto the straight stitch. So essentially it's just gonna be in the middle of both of those. We're gonna zigzag the pocket just the bottom edge as the top will be covered later on. And a reminder, don't forget to return back to your straight stitch settings when you're done. Okay, let's talk about panel number three, the rear leg panel. We're gonna attach it to the front leg starting at the out seam, but if you wanted to add rear pockets to this, now would be a great time to do it before we attach them. However, none of the pants that I've seen, joggers or sweatpants, come with a rear pocket and it's probably because the fabric's a little bit stretchy and unstructured. So anything you put in that pocket, it's gonna pull the fabric down a bit. It's gonna be a little loose. So that's probably why they don't do it, but that shouldn't stop you. If you wanna do that, they're your pants made by you, for you. So if you want a rear pocket, now's a good time. Otherwise, let's start with panel three and attach it to the old team. Then the next step. Okay, so let's add this rear leg panel into the mix. Let's put pocket panel number one and the front leg panel number two on the table, right sides up, and let's place the rear leg panel number three on top, right sides together. You'll know it's a correct leg because when the right sides are together, the long edge on both panels will match up, and on the other side, the pointed curved edge will also match. I'll start at the top, matching the top edge, and then clipping my way down. And then I'll also want to make sure that that pocket is aligned and clipped in as well so that when we stitch, it's included in that stitch. Another tip when we're clipping, we don't want to be pulling at the fabric and stretching it out. We really want to smoothen it out and let it relax so that when you're clipping it, it's not being stretched. And now we're going to start sewing the out seam. So we're going to do this at 3 8 of an inch seam allowance. A good reminder now is when the panel typically hangs over the table edge, so it's better not to. I like to have it folded in front of me, in front of the machine instead. And then so on. Don't forget to do your back stitches and also do the same steps for the alternate leg. Now that the outseam is done, let's attach them at the inseam. And you'll notice that the rear leg is a little bit wider than the front leg. So gently lift the front leg to match the edges of the inseam together. We're gonna clip them together. We're gonna sew at 3 8 of an inch and we're gonna back stitch at the beginning and the end, like always. Before we zigzag or overlock the outseam and the inseam, if you plan on tapering the leg from the outseam, I would start at the knee and create a straight stitch narrowing down the leg. I would probably start with a more modest taper at first, sew it, 
try it on, and then repeat until you find the right width that you like, and then just duplicate it on the other leg. When everyone's ready to serge the edges, we're going to go back to a zigzag stitch, length of three, tension of three, width of three, and then we're gonna zigzag the out seam and the in seam. Once you're done all of that, it's gonna be a lot of stitches. A reminder to return back to your straight stitch settings after. And hey, don't forget to stay hydrated, y'all. Now's a good time for a quick water break. So both legs are cleaned on the out seam and the in seam. Let's attach the legs at the rise. So flip one leg right sides out. So the fluffy side, the wrong side is on the inside. And then now put that same leg with the right sides out inside the other leg. It's gonna seem kind of weird, but trust me. Once it's inside, you should have both front legs in one hand, evident by the side pockets and the rear legs in the other hand. Starting at the crotch, so we can line up where the seams meet, we're gonna clip it. When you're clipping it, you want to look at the seam allowance and instead of having both seam allowances on one side, we'll actually alternate them so it helps reduce the bulk. Then we'll clip it outwards on each side until we reach the ends. Once that's complete, let's sew it at 3 8 of an inch all the way from the front to the back in one foul swoop. We're gonna back stitch at the beginning, and you guessed it, we're gonna back stitch at the end. When that's complete, let's zigzag or serge or overlock, all mean the same thing. We're gonna clean the raw edges at the same line. We're gonna go back to our zigzag stitch settings, sew it up, and then return back to our normal stitch settings. Now's the exciting part because we put in a lot of time creating the side seam pockets, uh, stitching the out seams together, the in seams, zigzag stitching or serging all of the raw edges. Now it's time to unravel these pants and see if all that work was worth it. We'll pull one leg out of the other. Now the pants are inside out. Let's pull the right sides out. Voila, leg numero un, leg number two. The pockets are clean, the rise, the out seam looks fine. Let's try it on just to test it out. At the top of the pants, it's gonna be extra long because we haven't added the elastic which will fold down. Um, anytime you're trying things on, you gotta give those standard random dynamic stretches because you never know what you're gonna be doing in these pants. So let's go back to what I was talking about with this straight stitch. When the straight stitches are running vertically, the way we attach them, there's very little risk of it breaking because we're never really stretching it vertically. If anything, we're stretching it horizontally, which is why the fleece was cut to maximize the stretch in the legs in the horizontal direction. And at the waist, you have to stretch it beyond this to, to really break the stitches. And with the elastic, I doubt it'll ever go that wide because we're never stretching our pants out that wide to fit into our pants. And before we take them off, throw those crafty hands into your pockets. Make sure to check them in case there's clips or maybe even worse, some low key instructions to subscribe to some random sewing channel you found. Okay, so let's do the waistband now. With the waistband, it is one and a half inch tall elastic. We're gonna measure our waist and then subtract two to four inches depending how tight you want it. Two inches will give you a more looser fit which is ideal for something like elastic with drawstring. And then four inches gives you a lot tighter of a fit. Anywhere in between that, you should be good. We're gonna join the elastic ends by overlapping them by one inch and then clipping or pinning them together. And then to lock it in place, two stitches horizontally, we're going to do one stitch starting and ending before the ends. And then when we're done, just lift the presser foot up move the elastic and then sew again in one quick stitch. Now it's somewhat held together, let's add some more reinforcement by doing a box stitch about a quarter inch from the edges. So grab some chalk, mark the end so that you could see it on one side, and then you'll know where to contain your stitches to. Draw a box inside that about a quarter inch from the edges, throw it under the sewing machine, and then create a stitch following those boxes. Turning with the needle in the down position at each corner because we're pros at sewing on a turn now. You can also throw the elastic over your waist right now to test out the fit. Give it a quick stretch test to make sure it's good. And if you're happy with it, let's figure out how to pin the elastic to the waist. So to start off, let's divide the waistband into four equal quadrants. Grab some chalk and mark the middle of the overlapping ends. We're gonna pinch at that mark 
and then fold the elastic and run to the other side to mark the other half. Match those two points that we just drew and then slide to each end outwards, marking with chalk. And now you have it divided in four equal parts. We're gonna do the same drill, but for the sweatpants. The front and back rise seams are the halves. So if we clip those together, we can then work our way out to mark the chalk on the left and right leg. Smooth out the fabric as you make your way towards each end and draw a fairly large line for these ones. And now you can unclip and mark chalk at the front and back seams if you like. So now we're prepped, let's attach these two. Place the elastic inside the waist along the wrong side of the fabric, and we're gonna clip them together at each quadrant marking. I like to put the overlapped elastic at the back of the seam of the pants. After you'll have four clips attaching the waistband to the fabric all around. It's gonna seem kind of messy and chaotic because the elastic is going to be smaller than the fabric, so it's gonna pull it in a little bit. But don't fret, this was on purpose and this will help you create the stretch in the waistband. To sew these together, we'll need to stretch the elastic so that it matches the circumference of the fleece. But the four clips are pretty far between each other and I'm not that strong to hold it steady for that long. So here's a little tip that'll help us out. Find two adjacent quadrants or clips and pinch them together. Then smooth out the elastic to a point and at that fold, we're gonna mark it with chalk. We're gonna do the same thing, pinch the clips and do the same thing smoothing outwards so that we find the fold of the fabric and mark that as well. And now you can match up those two markings on the elastic and the fabric together. We're gonna keep doing this all the way around to transform our clippings from quadrants to now octants, which is much more manageable. This might be the first time I've ever used the word octants in my vocabulary. And now we're gonna to switch to the zigzag stitch settings. If you're lucky and own a serger or an overlocker machine, ensure that when you're stitching this that the blade isn't cutting into the elastic as we run through the step. And here's where we're gonna do a zigzag stitch to connect the waistband to the elastic while also, you know, cleaning up the raw edges. We're gonna place the fabric in so that the elastic is on top because that's what we're focusing on and we're gonna drop the presser foot. So here's how to sew elastic. We need to sew so that the fleece is flush with the elastic. To do that, you'll need your right hand on the back clip and your left hand pitching the front clip behind the machine. You're gonna pull your hands apart just enough so that the fleece is flush with the elastic and you don't wanna overstretch it. You only wanna pull it the right amount. Then you're gonna start sewing, letting the feed dogs of the sewing machine pull the fabric while your hands move with it, keeping that same spacing that allows the elastic to stretch to the extent of the fleece. I could show you first a few stitches so that we have it right. So you're gonna have your right hand in front, left hand in the back, and we're gonna do a back stitch to start, which at that point you'll have to let go to hold the lever, which is fun. And then pull the fabric and the elastic apart so that the fabric is flush with the elastic and let the machine do the pulling. Your hands are just moving, keeping the same spacing, and sew until you reach the next clip. Remove that clip and then continue with that same method around the entire waist at about a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch seam allowance. This is just gonna tie up the edge. Um, it won't be shown on the outside, so the seam allowance doesn't really matter here. Just focus on keeping that stretch consistent. You'll want the edge of the fabric to match up with the edge of the elastic as much as possible, but this is a very tricky stitch, so it's not always gonna be perfect. Let the feed dogs do the pulling. Your hands are just there for the ride. So match the speed to the machine and just guide the fabric through gently. It's gonna be a bit of a bumpy ride, but the elastic will be attached to the fabric. This is probably the hardest part of the tutorial. So give yourself a pat on the back if you got through this and let's focus on casing the elastic. Start by folding the elastic down towards the wrong side and thus creating that casing. At the quadrants, marked pretty largely from our previous chalk markings, we're gonna add pins or clips. Similar to how we broke down the elastic quadrants into octants, we're gonna do the same thing when the fabric and the elastic are flush like this, but it's hard to do with only two hands. So there's two ways that we can do this. The first, find two adjacent clips. You're gonna grab them with your palm and your pinky ring fingers and pull them apart so it's flush. 
with your thumb and index finger, roll the fabric down so that there's no slack. And then when it's ready, pinch with one hand and hold it in place while you use your other hand to clip it in. You're gonna repeat these same steps and add another clip until you have four clips held in. So maybe more than an octant at this point. The other way, it's, it's a little bit easier. So instead of using our palms, we're gonna use the table. Pull the fabric apart using your middle finger to hold it down to the desk and pull the fabric enough again so it's flush. Then use your index finger to walk inwards and pin it down inside. Hold that, grab a pin, clip it in and repeat. I find this method a little bit easier and once you have four clips are in, you can use your fingers to massage the fabric slack out. Repeat this around the entire waist so that it's all locked in. And then on the inside, we're gonna flatten out that side pockets. The top of it will lay underneath the elastic inside the casing. So we want that lined up and then we'll pin the pockets to the front leg panel so that they're locked in, in place, they won't move when we start doing the stitches. And now we're gonna straight stitch it in, but you might be wondering why would we use a straight stitch if it's the waist that'll be stretched? Like, won't it break? Well, when we stretch the elastic to match the fleece, we're essentially stitching it at the fleece's resting state, which from the previous example, we can see that it's, it's very, very large waist. And when we fit into our sweatpants, we're not really stretching the fleece to this point, we're just stretching the elastic more than we are the fleece. You'd have to really, really stretch it far for it to even reach a potential breaking point, which I don't think you'll run into. And I've used a straight stitch on all my samples as well with no issues, so you'll be okay. Starting at the back rise, we're gonna install our top stitches to close in this casing. So we're gonna sew from 3 8 of an inch from the edge all the way around with a back stitch at the beginning and the end. That never gets old. Same as before, stretch out the fabric between each clipping so it's taut, it's flush, and don't overstretch it. Just move your hands with the feed. As you're moving along, check that the side pockets are still tucked under that elastic and pinned in place and give the fabric a little tug to remove some slack from the fabric casing. At this point, you can add some extra top stitches here as well if you like to customize your look a little bit or if you're happy with it, then we can move on to trying them on. Before you try them on, remember to remove the pins in the pocket first. I want to prevent injuries here. No one has to get poked. So the pants are 90% done. We just need to finish the hems. Before we decide on what hem we wanna do, we can do a couple checks. One, do you want to taper the pants? Now is probably your last chance. And two, check the length so that it looks right. Knowing that we'll lose a few inches based on the cuff for the hem that we decide on, but generally you can get a decent idea of how short you want it at this point. And if all looks well, Let's move on to the next step. Moving on to the next step, yeah. Moving on to the next step, yeah. If you're happy with the pants, let's add in that woven tag that comes with the DIY kits. So find a placement you like. I will put this on the right rear leg just under the waistband and try to pin it around the center of that design. And then we're just gonna set up a straight stitch. We're gonna stitch the edges down until it looks something like this. All right, choosing the cuff or the hem. So we have three options to choose from here. You could do the folded hem, which is the easiest one to do. You could do the elastic, which is the same technique that we use for the waistband. Or you can do ribnet, which is similar to the boxy hoodie sleeve cuffs. It might even be worth watching the steps for all three situations so that you can know what to expect and see the outcome of each before deciding on what you wanna do. So for the folded hem, it's pretty standard keeps it open at the bottom. We're gonna do a zigzag stitch on the edge, but again, purely just for the aesthetic since the edge of the fleece won't fray. We're gonna do a chalk mark one inch from the edge on the right side, though you can make this bigger or less depending on how big of a hem you want. And then we're gonna fold it and press it and clip it. Make sure you have it on a low temperature when you're using the iron and don't iron those clips. And then open up the free arm if you can. And we're gonna start stitching at a quarter of an inch less than the hem length you chose. So for me, I'm gonna do three quarters of an inch 
because one inch minus a quarter inch is three quarters of an inch. We'll start at the inseam because that's the most inconspicuous spot. And whenever you're starting a stitch, you usually want to start in somewhere that's less noticeable. And we're going to back stitch at the beginning and the end. And then one more press to keep things clean. And this is what the folded hem option looks like. For the elastic cuff, we're going to have different lengths of elastic based on our size. And if you tapered the pants, you're going to want to cut this even shorter. We're going to mark one inch with chalk and overlap the ends. We're going to clip them together, stitch it twice horizontally or parallel with the elastic to lock it in. And then you may have to take off the clips for this to hold it because of the presser foot. Then do your box stitches around to lock it in even more. These are the same steps as before, so maybe you remember it, but we're gonna mark the quadrants of the elastic with chalk. One in the middle of the box, we're gonna fold it, mark the opposing side. We're gonna match up those two marks, smoothen outwards to find those last two to complete the quadrants. We're gonna use the inseam as your starting point and fold to find the opposing half on the hem. We're gonna mark the chalk and then match them together and find the other two marking points. And now you have your quadrants on both the elastic and the fabric. We're gonna place the elastic inside the hem on the wrong side, matching the box stitch to the inseam, and then clipping all four quadrants together. We won't have to make this into octants this time because the cuff is pretty small, so we can hold it between the clips um, without too much slack in between. We're gonna zigzag the edges together. We're gonna to pull the fabric top, but let the machine dictate the feed. And we're gonna ensure the fabric looks flat, but not overly stretched and try to match the edge of the fabric with the edge of the elastic. We're gonna fold down the elastic towards the wrong side, thus casing the elastic. And then we're gonna add our clips at those chalk marked quadrants. We're gonna straight stitch these closed. We're gonna sew on the wrong side at three eighths of an inch from the edge. Starting at the inseam because it's a less noticeable spot. And then you'll know you're feeling comfortable with these stitches when you start getting all the fingers involved with the back stitch and such. And that is an elastic cuff. Woo! It's looking nice. Oh, I remember my first, first pair of sweatpants that I ever owned had these elastic cuffs, so it feels right. And now the last option is the rib knit. So with the pattern, you'll need to cut out two pieces, one for each leg, and then line it up with the direction of the greatest stretch, which means, as you can see here, it stretches a lot horizontally, not so much vertically, so we've got the orientation right. When we're cutting the two, we can actually fold it to cut two layers at once. And if you tapered your legs, again, you'll want to trim down the rib knit a little bit shorter to accommodate for that. Pin the pattern down to the fabric and cut away. And when you're done, we're gonna fold the rib knit in half horizontally so that the ends meet. We're gonna clip it and then sew it in at 3 eighths of an inch, doing your back stitch beginning and end, of course. Then we're gonna fold the bottom half up to the top edge. So now it's a double layered rib knit cuff. We're gonna match the seams together. That's gonna be our starting point. We're gonna clip it there. And like before, hold down that seam to find the other half, mark it, then match the seams and the marking. Together, split the ribnet into four equal parts. We do this a lot, but it helps us make sure everything's aligned. And then we're gonna clip the ends together. Then grab the hem of the pants, make quadrants based off the inseam as your starting point. And then we're gonna find the inseam of the hem and the ribnet. And we're gonna scrunch up the hem so that we could place the ribnet around it with the open end lined up with the hem the edge. Clip both at the seams and then you're gonna work your way around clipping at the quadrants. We're actually gonna straight stitch this first at three eighths of an inch and then you could zigzag the edges after doing your back stitches beginning and I don't know if I have to remind you anymore but I will until it looks something like this which you may want to add an extra little step where we do a top stitch to hold down the seam allowance so it looks like this. So to do this we're gonna pull the seam allowance so it's on the side of the fleece and up the leg and then as you mount the cuff, you're gonna want to use your fingers to confirm that the seam allowance is still on that right side and then stitch at a quarter of an inch from the seam. And this is the rib knit option. Fleece loves to leave bits of lint in your sewing machine. So make sure, make sure at the end of your sewing session to clean that bad boy up. And if you're still in the mood to sew, maybe you wanna make a matching hoodie to go with the new sweatpants. Maybe you wanna make a bucket hat or you wanna embroider something like this crew neck that I've been wearing all day, then check out my channel. I got more sewing tutorials, advice, 
I got tutorials on how to make tees, bags, shorts. You want it, I got it. And this is how you sew sweatpants. Until next time.